Um, okay, so with that, I'm going to go on to the next part, which is gene pool changes. So we know that for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we're trying not to change anything, but these are kind of going more in depth into each of these little things that each of these different factors that um, would not allow you to be able to use those Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equations or you know, follow the idea of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So one is mutations, um, broadly mutations, but this slide is particularly point mutations. So um, silent mutations, which is the change of a single DNA nucleotide that does not change the amino acid. So over here, we have the first um, column, which is the original amino acid. And here in the silent mutation, although we change this C to a T, it's still producing the lysine. So it's silent as in it's not really changing that amino acid. Then there's nonsense, which is a change of a single DNA nucleotide that changes the original amino acid into a stop codon. So here we see that, you know, this nucleotide was changed to a U and then suddenly it became a stop codon, which completely stopped, you know, um, that chain so that it probably cut short. Um, and so whenever it has like a stop codon, you guys should probably know like the three stop codons by now um, because of all your studying or even in undergrad taking like bio or chemistry classes. Um, but that is a nonsense mutation. And then missense is when there's a change of a single DNA nucleotide that changes the amino acid. So from for this portion, we see that, you know, um, that middle T is eventually changed to a C, and this creates an arginine instead of the lysine that was originally there. Um, so I, there is this conservative versus non-conservative in the sense of like the, the fact that, you know, both of these are the same type of like charged amino acid, and then this kind of changes it to a different group. Um, so that's like something else to note, but in general, in this sense, just changes that original amino acid. And then also there are frame shift mutations. So insertions, you know, when DNA nucleotides are added to the original DNA nucleotide sequence and deletions when DNA nucleotides are removed from the original DNA nucleotide sequence. So both of these affect the final amino acid sequence because it really like changes that how it eventually, how the amino acids are eventually like translated from the mRNA, and which is from that DNA. So um, many times when there are frame shift mutations, it usually causes a change that causes like a stop codon, and that is what cuts the protein short instead. So that tends to be a very common effect. And then going on, there are also chromosomal mutations. So on the level of the chromosome. So here I have the diagrams on the right. So first, so I mean, there are insertions and deletions kind of similar to the, you know, nucleotide sequence level, like you're adding and deleting certain things um, from the chromosome itself. So it's kind of like a similar idea in the sense. And then on top of that, there are inversions, so when a chromosomal segment breaks off and reattaches in the opposite direction, so inversion you see here, you have the like one piece and then like the two pieces there, and it inverts so that those two pieces are actually on the original area where that one piece was, and then there's that one piece. And then duplication is when a chromosomal segment is copied one or multiple times in the chromosomal region. So here we have that it got duplicated twice, so it got copied twice. And then translocation is when a chromosomal segment breaks off and reattaches at another location in the chromosomal region. So this, um, so you see these two chromosomes here, this bottom portion of the green chromosome translocated to the bottom of the pinkish one, and then it, this pink went to the bottom of the green one, so that at the end you see that here is that translocation of these two chromosomes. Um, and then, so mutations was like one group 
that could change, you know, the allele frequencies. But then the other aspect is genetic drift, which is the change in allele frequencies because of a sampling error from one generation to the next. I will say that genetic drift is most common in smaller population sizes. So that's something to know. Um, and then under that like umbrella of genetic drift is um, you know, genetic leakage, which that case is when um, there are unviable offspring or the organisms can't reproduce to give rise to their, their next generation. Um, so that you know, changes that allele frequency because then suddenly a whole group of offspring are just you know, taken out. Um, also, there is the founder effect, which is when few individuals separate from a larger population and create a new population isolated from, that's isolated from the previous one. So if you imagine like a whole population of deer or something, and um, let's say you have equal brown and um, tan deer, and then like all the brown deer decide to move away or something, like three of them move away, and then they are in this new population with um, that's isolated from this original one, then all of you know their offspring would most likely be the same like brown deer that you see. And so then that would change that allele frequency, which originally was like half and half to like 100 based, I mean, probably 100%. Um, or depending on if it's heterozygous, actually, then we're looking for probably like a 75 to 80% um, of that brown phenotype instead. And then population bottlenecks are when a large proportion of individuals perish um, from environmental disturbances, diseases, et cetera. So um, this is an example of like the bottleneck idea where you have that original population and then there's that bottlenecking and then the surviving population is a really small subset. So it's kind of like uh, another version of like, I mean, the effect is like a similar effect as the founder effect because you are then having the smaller population that mates with themselves. Um, and so they end up producing offspring that's more similar to them. Um, but yeah, like environmental disturbances, um, hurricanes, tornadoes, you name it, all these different things that could cause a whole population or a decent amount of a population to pass away or like disease. Um, in this case, maybe an environmental disturbance for these beetles or if someone like steps on them. Um, and then there's only this small amount of the population left in the region. Um, and then the final or the final group of ideas is like natural selection, which as you guys might know already is the, um, the basic definition would be the survival of the fittest. So there are three main types of selections that they go over usually. Disruptive selection, which is when the two extreme phenotypes are maintained compared to that intermediate phenotype. So I have this diagram on the right side, which shows that. So this red line denotes the before. So as you can see, all of the images have, well, except for this one, but these two have that before population. And then because of disruptive selection, um, the two extremes here are made instead of that middle area from the original. And then there's stabilizing selection when there is the maintenance of that intermediate phenotype as opposed to the extremes. And then directional selection, which is when one extreme phenotype is maintained more than the other phenotypes. So in this case, it was originally at this extreme and then because of directional selection, maybe something happened with that other phenotype, it caused you know all of these organisms to end up moving to this extreme instead. So that's how that is. And then finally, um, I'm going into evolution. So that's like the last, I, I feel like, break, um, point out of this lecture, um, in which evolution is the change in the heritable characteristics of a biological population over successive generations. So the main three that they like to go over, I think, in most of the review books is divergent evolution, which is when two species evolve and develop differences from a common ancestor. And so here on the right upper part, I have that um, 
visual of like divergent populations. Here we go to that S and the T, even though the ancestor um, is, well, these two should be connected in a sense. Um, One moment. But <laughs> these two should be connected, so they're diverging into these two different species. Um, and then usually they also have homologous features um, in which they share a unique physical feature. Um, I would say most of the times, even though they share this original like backbone of how, how this feature looks, they tend to be, um, they tend to have like a different feature when, when it's considered like a homologous feature. Um, so that's something to know. And then parallel evolution is when two species with a common ancestor retain like similar, it's the similar traits. So it's both the S and the S traits, that's the same. And then for convergent evolution, it's when two species without a common ancestor develop similar characteristics. So these two different ancestors, but they still create that um, similar characteristic, most likely because of the environments that they're in. And this kind of goes into like analogous features, which um, they evolved, you know, these features evolved independently because the organisms lived in similar environments. And so um, here we have like analogous legs in which, you know, not like analogous legs and analogous flippers. So the structure themselves don't really look quite like the same, but they have, if you think about like the same type of function. So cat leg and praying mantis leg, both for walking, and for the whale flipper and this water boatman flipper leg, which is for an insect, um, both of them are allowing the individual, the organism to like swim. So <laughs> that's something to know. And then I'm gonna end, I believe with this final question. Okay, with that, we have 100% saying choice C. So you guys, great job. Um, the answer is C. I guess uh, this is pretty self-explanatory. All of you guys got it. But for anyone else who um, was just curious, so the question says, a mutation caused rabbits to have a faster reflex to sense danger. After several generations, there was a greater proportion of the population of rabbits that inherited this faster reflex. Why was this the case? So. Um, with choice A, the mutation was more prevalent because of genetic drift. Um, here, it doesn't mention anything causing genetic drift, so that's why this answer is, is incorrect. Um, also, mutations are, I mean, yeah, so basically it just doesn't say here um, because it's just saying after several generations, you know, there was this greater proportion. They're not saying that the generations were changed in any way. Um, next for B, other rabbits learn how to develop this faster reflex by watching rabbits with the mutation. So um, although, you know, they may learn the skill, really um, we see in this question that there was a greater proportion of the population that inherited this reflex. So they would have had to inherit this mutation from their previous um, parents, which in that case, it wouldn't only necessarily be like learning. And I feel like in that sense, learning um, doesn't, learning the reflex doesn't necessarily show that you have um, this, this mutation. And then for D, the mutation was not able to be passed down from one generation to the next. If it wasn't able to be passed down from each of the generations, then their offspring wouldn't be able to inherit it. And so then there wouldn't be a greater proportion that had this faster reflex. Um, so that's why D is incorrect. And so that's why C, rabbits with this mutation are more likely to reproduce and survive compared to those that do not have this mutation. I think this is a common answer for a lot of those evolution questions that you may see. But yes, so um, because they're able to continue reproducing um, and surviving, then they're able to create more of these rabbits that have this faster reflex from the mutation.